Okay. We have Evan James Sheldon here, the author of Children and Their Cages. I'm so excited to be picking his brain over all the weird, speculative, intriguing stories that are in this. But Evan James Sheldon is a writer of weird fiction, also serves as the senior editor for Friction, the literary magazine where he likewise acts as the features editor. He also serves in a capacity as the editorial director for the literacy nonprofit Brink Literacy Project. So really excited to have him here. He's going to do a short reading to get us started, and then we'll pick his brain over this book. So what are you going to read for us, Evan? Um, well, first, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. We were talking before, and it's kind of a treat to get to, to talk about a book that is smaller like this, so it's pretty fun. Um, so I'm going to read something. It's kind of from the middle of the book um, called The River Before Dawn. Um, all right. I'm in the boat, a small two-seated wooden affair without oars, but one long pole, and I'm leaving for the opposite shore when I hear whistle. People who whistle for the attention of others are almost always terrible, and I know I should push down into the mucky bottom and call it a night. It's late, and nothing good ever happens after midnight, as my mother would say, but it's only one person, and I'm hitting for the other side, for home, anyway. I turn around and wait for the, wait as the person clumsily climbs into the boat, shaking it from side to side. I'm standing, and I almost walk it a bit harder to see if the person will topple into the water, but I don't do it. Restraint is the better part of valor, as my mother would say. It's my father, he a long cloak that he's rummaging around in awkwardly, who flips a couple of coins in my direction that clatter on the bottom of the boat, the sound echoing out across the river. I turn and begin pushing us home without saying anything. I hear a soft, wet sound. My father is holding something and quietly weeping. I can't make out what's in his hands, but he shifts and it lulls like a dead thing. Tough night, I ask, trying to deepen my voice to an unrecognizable baso. I'm not quite sure why I do this, perhaps for the same reason I didn't announce myself when I recognized him. He's up to something unusual, plus I don't want him to know that I've been ferrying people across the river at night. My father is nothing if not protective. I don't want to defend my own choices, but maybe I him to have to defend his own, whatever they are. He cradles the dead thing with one arm and pulls out an old cream-colored handkerchief, wipes his eyes and his nose. He laughs a dark laugh, a sound that I've heard from him before. You can say that. But then, that would be correct on almost any night in this town. As we draw near to the far shore, the pine trees shift from a dark wall to individual stark shakes, uh, stark shakes, a different texture of black against the night sky. Most nights are tough nights. It almost sounds like an aphorism, something my mother would say, but there's something about the way he says it, a weariness to his tone that makes it ring true. I wonder what he's up to at night, who this person is that sneaks out and returns crying over dead small things. All he's ever been before is my father, steadfast if quiet, a bit boring really, the kind of father you don't realize is good until you meet other fathers. Now I think back through my 16 years and find hundreds of moments to question his behavior. So do you cross the river often, I ask? Even as I say it, it sounds like a bad pickup line, something I've never thought I would mutter to my father. Not often enough, he says. He kisses whatever it is he's holding and lets it slide gently into the water. It drops without a sound, without anyone but the two of us to see. We coast the rest of the way in, even though I've landed the boat a dozen of times, the shore is jarring. I hop out and drag the boat all the way up into the beach. My father steps past me. I plan to wait a while before sneaking home, give him some time to get there and get in bed, if he hits home, and I realize how little I know of him, maybe of all the people in my life. My father stops and turns. Come now, son. Your mother can never sleep when we are both out at night. It takes me seven, several moments before I can collect myself enough to follow him into the trees. Thank you. That, yeah. is, that is so beautiful. I love the bit at, you know, maybe three quarters through where they're saying all he's ever been before is my father steadfast of quiet a bit boring really the kind of father you don't realize is good until you meet other fathers and just you know so many of these stories kind of explore these familial relationships at varying levels of like intimacy loss closeness um you know what power do you think speculative fiction has to explore that or what was your intent with some of these stories yeah, I, uh, it's kind of interesting. When I first started writing some of these, I think um, I wasn't really writing towards my own um, family, if that makes sense. More, uh, a lot of them kind of develop a, out of like 
maybe a generational comment or that sort of thing where I'm looking at um, maybe what we've inherited from our fathers at, at this point um, in, in kind of the game. Um, and so a lot of the story started out with that spark, but um, kind of in the middle of writing a lot of these pieces or publishing them originally, um, I, my wife and I had our first child. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of things in my perspective um, have changed and just have morphed over time. So um, there's, there's a little bit of, uh, particularly with that story, you see a little bit more grace for um, the father figure in that story than you will perhaps in other, uh, some of the other pieces. Um, and that's just kind of evident of, of my own like experience. <laughs> like maybe I should uh, be a little bit more gentle <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> I love that. And congratulations, by the way, that's a huge milestone to have in life. So, so Thanks. having a baby obviously impacted your writing in that kind of perspective sense. Did it impact it in any other like themes that you wanted to bring forth? Well, real, on a real simple level, um, you know, it affected the form that I write in a lot, um, just on simple time wise. I, uh, so the, the most of this book is, written as flash fiction, um, you know, one of the, I don't know, kind of like cliche advice things that I heard when I was first not writing was, uh, you know, finish the scene, finish the scene um, that you're in. Um, don't leave off because you won't be able to pick up the thread. Um, but I found I didn't really have a lot of time to like be finishing things. And so I just mm. finished the piece. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the end. <laughs> the end this is this is the end and um so yeah some of some of um how how this book developed was just purely um you know sitting down in the morning trying to write for a half hour and being like that's all i can do and yeah. move on you know <laughs> and let's go write something different tomorrow you know yeah um, that's so. so so interesting. So then other than time in your personal life, what was the process like putting together a collection of short stories? Because in a way they have like kind of a, a similar beat or feel to them, but they're all kind of their own unique piece as well. What was that like? It, it's really kind of odd to look back at it at this point. Um, maybe we can talk about it maybe a little bit later, but um, I, my, my writing style and uh, even some of what I'm interested in, like, um, kind of pursuing um, have changed over time as probably for everybody. Um, but <laughs> um, when I was first writing these, um, I wrote quite a lot of speculative fiction. Um, there's, there's four, I don't remember how many, how many parts are in this book, five, some, some number of parts. Um, and each one, um, when I was laying it out very specifically starts with a fairy tale where a child, uh, is doing something um, and realizes part of themselves is something something different, yeah. um, and that reshapes kind of the way they interact um, with their reality. And so I, when I was laying it out, I realized I had these kind of like um, pillars that I wanted to, to build around, and then I tried to look for um, a, a kind of a natural arc. Um, through the pieces and um, so I went with more of a kind of like linear linear type arc where the, the the children get older and become parents themselves or don't become parents the last story in the book is um, an old man playing with children um, that he has never had before um, and so I, I, I tried I, I hopefully there's a, a good feel to it overall in that kind of um in the way i laid it out the publisher was super chill with that he was like you can do whatever you want just put it in there and he was like going back through my other uh other things i published and he's like can we put this in can we fit this in here and um so that was that was pretty cool um but yeah it was it was an odd experience to kind of go through all this material because it's not that long of a book, um, but it's a lot of stories because they're yeah. so short. Um, and so I try to arrange them in a way that uh, hopefully will leave the reader feeling some sort of movement towards the end was was interesting. And to like, I, I haven't written a fairy tale in 
quite a long time now, and um, the book is filled with them. So it's it's strange. <laughs> so I gonna, yeah, I was going to ask you about the fairy tales because they are just like woven throughout, and I love hearing that intentional kind of arc or aging that you you did. And now that I'm thinking, I'm like, it did do that. Like that's so cool. <laughs> um, what was it like writing fairy tales? Did you read a lot of them beforehand, or? Um, yeah, I, so I, I read um, almost exclusively speculative fiction growing up. I, you know, aside from the, the stuff that you have to read in school. And then um, I had a couple really good English professors in college um, that kind of opened me up to some different things. Um, but um, I really got turned on to fairy tales specifically from um, an essay written by Kate Bernheimer uh, called Form is Fairy Tale, Fairy Tales Form, or might be the other way around, Fairy Tales Form, form is one of those two. Yeah. Uh, you can Google Google her name and fairy tale, and it's like the first PDF that pops up. Um, but when I was uh, first trying to think through how to structure stories, um, her essay was one that I came across, and it it does fairy tales do some things that um, lots of different writers use, um, but probably wouldn't say they use because fairy tales are like, you know, fairy tales. Um, yeah. The so stories or whatever you want to call them. But um, for me, I found it super helpful um, when I was trying to organize these other things that I was doing, um, trying to think through some speculative things, some family things, um, generational type things. Um, and I, I found the form really allowed me to play in the other areas without having to think about uh, the structure that I was um, kind of working in. So it's like, I don't know, like if you, if you only if you only use like red and black and white paint or something and yeah. <laughs> try to paint a bunch of different pieces using those, um, yeah. you know, maybe just one won't have a lot of meaning, but if you look at a bunch of them all together, hopefully they uh, kind of talk about what you're doing. If that makes cool. any sense at all. It does, it does. <laughs> That's a cool way to think of, um, Kind of building like a skeletal base to work off of for all these mm -hmm. that's interesting so when you said earlier that your your writing has changed do you think it's become less speculative or have you moved away from fairy tales or how has it changed yeah um so yes and no i still am really drawn to the um a couple of the elements that are pretty traditional in fairy tales there's like certain flatness of character and the way descriptions are given, they're often, you know, very, um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna read a fairy tale about a chartreuse hat or, you know, like very, <laughs> into, you know, it's like, it's like, this was red, there was glass, it was shiny. Yeah. Um, and for me, when you're, I, I, I think for the writing that I like to do, um, it allows for a little bit more reader interaction. Um, Perhaps I don't know if that's actually true, but I, I do still still use those. Um, but yeah, I, I I tend towards more literary style fiction these days um, mm -hmm. than probably straight fairy tales. I don't know, like I don't know if that's actually blend? true, but that's yeah yeah. I've got um, another book coming out hopefully this year, and it has. Um, yeah, it's got some pieces that are um, probably what the majority of it is more uh, of that kind of literary uh, style where out, you know, where there's not not boys waking up with claws for hands and fields or what have you, you know, there's right, a, right. Um, a little bit more, more explainable sure. kind of phenomenon happening. Um, but I, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm what I'm doing now. Cool. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you about your next project. So let's go there. What is your next project called? This literary, is it still a short story collection or? Yeah. So um, right now it's got a working title that my my daughter, who's now four, she came up with and it's, um, we're calling it, um, when we look down, our eyes don't fall out, which um, <laughs> definitely, I definitely love it. doesn't yeah, it uh, definitely doesn't sound like the literary fiction, I guess, but <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a strange collection, and I didn't really realize that I had it pulled together. I've um, been working on a novel for 
I guess now a couple years. And whenever I get stuck, I write a piece, like a short story from uh, another character or the main character um, off the main plot, but set in the same town and world. Um, just to kind of help my brain, my writing brain kind of keep rolling. Um, and the publisher, he reached back out. It's like, I hope you have something I can publish this year. And I was like, I definitely don't. I haven't been writing. I just had, we had another child, my wife and I, um, in November. And so I was like, there's no way I haven't been doing anything. And I was like, oh, I'll just look. And um, I put it all together in a document. And it's kind of like a, a, it's a linked short story collection because these small moments that I was trying to build this novel around um, are interacted with from all these side characters. So it's it's kind of a kind of a different. It's a cool. I think it's cool. Have you read um, Revenge by Yoko Ogawa? No. But that, I love that. that book. Yeah, that book is killer. But there there's it. When I was putting it together, that's kind of what I was hoping for the feel of it to be. So like a small. For, for, for example, some of the way that they're, the stories are co connected, uh, in one story, there's a small boy who's throwing a uh, plastic plastic gun into this lake, and it's windy, so it keeps blowing back. It's just part of the kind of the plot of the, the story. And then at a different in a different story, um, a different character finds that toy gun and begins to like interact with it for her own story so those like real small details are the only ones that are really connecting these pieces um which you know can make for kind of an interesting reading experience where you it, it leaves you with a strange feeling of interconnectedness when you're done maybe but like all these little easter eggs kind of threaded throughout <laughs> and like fine yeah. oh yeah that's yeah kind of yeah that's yeah. cool so then do you envision or plan also still pursuing that novel project as well and having both of these pieces out in the world at some point yeah so um i think the the novel has just shifted over time as they do um and so what i thought i was writing about i wasn't as it happens and um so um as I'm kind of reworking it at this stage, it's uh, it, that was part of the reason why I was willing to put this other material for this book, um, because I'm not like none of it is usable, none of it is, uh, you know, it's adjacent, but it's not the same story anymore, right. um, and not even really the same same character. So this group of characters kind of has their own own place in this other book now. So what is the setting of the world that they're in? You said they're all in the same town. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a little mountain town um, set in Colorado. That's where I am as well. Um, it's called Hollow Hill, Colorado. Um, wow. At least right now, I'll see if editor changes it <laughs> for for now. That's yeah, but that's what it that's what it's working with. So You're working with cool. What is your relationship like with your publisher and your editor? You've kind of talked a bit about how you've been able to go back and forth with them, how they reach out to you. What's that like? Um, it's been it's been really positive, but you know, I um, indie publishing is a, a a strange, you know, kind of a strange and wonderful beast. It's um not for everybody, and I don't even know how much it really is for me either. Um, in in the end, I am really grateful to have this book out, um, but there's a lot of things that you you kind of have to do yourself that um, maybe aren't in my skill set. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm an editor myself. Um, I do work with story primarily. Um, and so that's kind of where I, I, you know, that's what energizes me or what I, what I like to do. Um, the the self-promotion and the marketing and all of that is really comes difficult for me. Um, and unfortunately that with, with indie, you can, you know, I can spend all my time editing the book and get it exactly where I want it. But then you also have to like, you know, take on this whole other it. job. Crazy. Role. <laughs> yeah. 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 Take so much time. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel so, like is indie yeah. publishing like a hybrid between traditional and self then in the way that you're talking about the marketing piece or do you think it's different altogether? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it, it kind of depends on where you fall out. I, I you know, with, uh, I've had a, a handful of folks, um, you know, read the book and then ask about the publisher and, um, 
you know, would this be a good fit for this kind of novel or would it be a good fit for this kind of whatever? And, um, you know, for me, I will say it, it's been a really good fit because of the types of things that I'm publishing. Um, you know, I've got a I've got a flash collection here that is part literary, part fairy tale, um, full of very strange things. And <laughs> yeah. the the market the market for that um, is larger than you would guess, but still difficult to sell, particularly because uh, you know it's. Um, I think it's like 50,000 words or something you know it's not like I mean it's like see it's a, it's yeah it's a book um and my next my next one is two um and for me for both it was like well I you know I don't I don't know what the market is for um you know selling flash fiction to you know Viking or Penguin or whoever <laughs> like yeah, yeah. This, right. this was this was a good fit for me to um get the book in fr front of as many people as I could, um, basically. And that's how I felt about the um, the next one that's coming out as well, where, you know, the publisher is great and they're actually growing quite a bit and they've, they've got a, you know, a marketing team and things of that nature now. So it'll be, Yay. hopefully it'll be, it'll be a little bit different experience uh, cool. this next time. But And it kind of sounds like you get to retain some of that creative and artistic design over the novel like you're saying you get to keep it at you know the the genre blend and the word count and all those things no one's making you change that when you get to do it this way yeah it's pretty killer if you you know if you're publishing something that's um you know american publishing in particular is you know there's a form that it needs to fit you know you need to 80,000 to 120,000 words and there needs to be a full arc and there needs to be you know where's your love interest and the first 20 pages have to have certain you know, check checklists and things of that nature. And I'm just, uh, you know, not really interested in doing that at this stage of things. Um, one of the things that I do every like two or three years, is I only read books that are translated into English. Um, and so that that's really informed a lot of my uh, kind of length choices, my form choices, um, people are doing just wild stuff out of out of the u.s there's amazing writers in the states too don't get me wrong but um you know there there's just if i send a thirty-five thousand page linked short story collection to you know an agent they're gonna laugh at me uh, right. but this public this publisher is like yeah this is dope let's do it okay yeah, yeah. um so there, yeah. there's there's some good benefits for that because so many books that are traditionally published and they're still great too, but they all follow those same like story beats and kind of those those points that they have to hit. And this was very, very different. It was refreshing. Um, but I was gonna ask you at some point, and it's interesting to hear that you're reading only books of translation. What books would you recommend for anyone to read right now or this year? Oh, um, let's see. Well, I'm reading Whale. What was the name of that author? It's Kim. I think it was just shortlisted for the Booker, actually. And it's super strange. That first, like the first paragraph, it's, it's it, you know, you talk about refreshing, like the, um, the first paragraph is like a recap of like 27 years of this person's history for... Whoa. And, then, and like they skip over major arson and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> it's wild. Wow. Um, yeah, it's wild. Uh, so that one is, it's called Whale by Chiang Myung Kwan. I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. No um, but that book has been really fun. And I'm just kind of getting into that. But um, it's definitely more of like a generational family type um, strange type book um Yo the revenge by yoko agawa is amazing um and then an, i also really let me see i've got my list here what is the name of that book i'll have to find it for you yeah there's there's Hi. some there's a couple um like south american authors who are just doing crazy stuff like just um really interesting things with form and um, but uh, my 
it, I don't think it was actually translated, but my favorite book that wasn't written in the States that I read every year is The Summer Book, oh. um, which it's like, it's short like this, it's flash, and it's, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a grandmother and the, her granddaughter on an island in Norway, I think, and they are just like, having these weird philosophical little conversations and it's quiet and lovely and it's oh, everything you need when you are feeling stressed out but want to read a book uh the summer book is, I, I wish i could read it for the first time again it's so good <laughs> so i good. love that description wanting to read something for the first time so it like hits you again that's cool yeah it's so good yeah. Um, I just picked up today a book of translation and I'm forgetting the author's name, but it's the person that wrote Tender is the Flesh and it's a short story collection. Oh. Um, oh, what's it called? I wish I had it in front of me. Um, something 19. Oh, let me look at it. Up. 19 Claws and a Blackbird. 19 Claws on a Blackbird. What a great title. I know, right? So I'm really excited, too, to to read her short stories as well. Because um, I love yeah. the flesh. And I, yeah, to read something that's translated will just be kind of interesting. So, cool. Yeah, that's fun. I, I alternate kind of between doing, like, reading Southern Gothic lit a bunch and then reading stuff in translation these days. Nice. Fun. Cool, yeah. cool. Um, what else was I going to ask you? I was going to ask you, so like all these stories are so strange as we've talked about, like the man breeding the blood red rabbits. There's a rug mm. that grows a tree and showers stars. Like they're all just so unique and intriguing. Did any of them share inspiration or concepts? And I know we talked about like the time of day you were writing in your life, but was there any like inspiration threaded in them? Um, I think the... The kind of what we talked about just briefly was like that I try to lead off each section with a uh, like kind of distinct fairy tale where, um, you know, a child has a like a physical change and then reacts to that. So like the, the lead off story, which, the you know, you, you I don't think that was in when we were recording, but we were talking about it before. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thrill the of the book is based on, you know, the, the kid is he he walks up to get um, ice cream and discovers that instead of a head, he has a cage for a head. Yes. Uh, and so um, those stories are kind of, they're all related in so far as I was um, interested in, like I wrote that one first maybe. And I just thought it was so strange in the way that um, the fairy tale form fits with that kind of writing, like that uh, that kind of speculative stuff, it really lends itself to it. And so um, I was like, I wanna do this again. So I tried it again and I was like, okay. And then it let me explore different kind of themes, but using that same structure and same kind of, um, almost like game plan going in, you know, like this is, yeah. this is something that we know is gonna happen. Um, so, you know, from, maybe from the outside looking in the book is filled with like a lot of weird and crazy things but for my brain when I was like putting it together I'm like oh there's this type of story there's this type of story you know like I'm there's this fit it in and structure yeah it park it. Yeah. Cool. yeah so that's so interesting yeah. Um, and you talked a bit about how you're an editor for the literary magazine fiction um, what advice would you give to writers that are interested in short stories specifically would it be to follow fairy tale form or to follow form in general or um you know i i think the the biggest thing to do would be to read the things that you are um, read the places you are sending your work to um which is hard because it's you know i've got i've got so many rejections it's crazy um, <laughs> it's difficult yeah. to to read all of the places you're going to send work to, but it really will save you a lot of time. And it also lets you kind of um, get a idea of the landscape you're trying to break into. So what type of stories that, you know, their editors are taking and looking for. Um, and it kind of lets you know what mistakes that people are making often, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Definitely reading for a journal, um, 
you see you see the things that are pulling readers out of stories over and over again and start to recognize them um, in your own writing like oh this is where this is I'm doing that same thing this person did when I stopped reading the story you know yeah. um, so there there's that piece um, just just reading as far as as form goes you know it works for me I don't know I think there's there's a couple really good books that talk a lot about this and they're both um, uh, they're the Tin House Writers Workshop books Tin House Writers workbooks something along those lines I think there's two of them um, yeah. but there's there's a couple excellent essays the Kate Bernheimer essay that we talked about earlier is in there. Uh, Amy Bender has two different ones, particularly if you're interested in writing strange fiction. Uh, she has something that I don't know that she talks about it directly, but one of the things that happens in that I that happen in uh, my stories a lot is there's one, you know, a person has a strange event happen to them. Like there's uh, there's a kid that let's talk about the um, head for a cage, cage for a head story. Yeah. You know, there, there's a, um, you know, he discovers that and he kind of goes to his own place, but instead of like kind of ending there, he ends up meeting another kid who also has a, a cage for a head. Um, in this case, he's made a different choice and put a bee over it, but um, there's, does. It, it kind of um, expands, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it expands the world um, beyond the kind of insular speculative moments. Um, and so for me, those those two books were really very formative. Um, maybe, you know, they came along when I was, uh, when I was still learning the style that I like to write in or still learning, um, still, still producing quite a lot of um, very short fiction. Um, yeah. So I, I would totally read those. Cool. And then, we, you know, we also talked about like finishing the scene, finish, finish what you're writing. You can't really fix it until you've, you've finished it. So those are, those are some things I would, I would recommend. Like finish the scene or like finish it is like the hardest piece of advice, but like the truest, right? It's so hard to like keep going sometimes when you're feeling stuck, but it's, it's interesting to hear that you said flash was kind of that kind of fix for that. That's, that's cool. Also, I started reading your book when I was, when I first got it in the mail, I was like, going and I was like meeting someone at a bar and so I started reading it in the bar as I was waiting and that first story at the end I was like oh like I made a audible sound and I was like oh well <laughs> that's all right that's okay it was that's okay yeah just like a strange uh, person sitting alone reading a book about cages you know I I bar <laughs> I bartended for about 15 years mm -hmm. and so um you know your bartenders love they love your your kind the kind that come in and oh, read books and I'm enjoy so them validated <laughs> yeah it's good it's so much better than pouring lots of shot of rumple mints and so forth so. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what i was drinking evan just kidding <laughs> yeah I, um, I guess i guess incorrectly this time yeah <laughs> oh, I'm just joking just joking that's awesome cool um i was gonna say thinking about you know you were you're saying like read and kind of research where you're submitting these short stories to, to and rejection being part of that um I just kind of want to I guess talk about that a little bit because rejection is such a part of writing and um in my spare time I also volunteer for a, a Minnesota-based literary magazine called Split Rock Review and it's all nature-based oh do you yeah. yeah so it's all like nature-based um and really, really cool, lots of poetry, but every now and then you get a piece in the during the submission time and it won't be anything close to the brief or the brand. And sometimes it's good too, but it's like, oh, I hate to say no, but it's not, you know, not on brand or not on brief. So yeah, I guess I don't know if I have a question connected with that, but more just like meditating on like, how sometimes fiction can be good, but rejection happens anyways, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it definitely does. I, you know, some of the stories, there's a story um, in here that made it into the Cincinnati Review, which was a pretty big publication for me. That's awesome. um, and one? it was rejected. Um, how deep the fight? It's the porcupine dinner story. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, um, that's cool. What did I call? I don't remember what the title is, but anyway, um, 
you know, that, that story is strange and, and um, it, it hit an editor who saw what I was trying to do at the right time. And, you know, it, it's, it was rejected probably, I don't know, 25 times before that, at least, like at least 25 times cool. uh, in random packets and, and what have you. And so, um, you know, and I've got, I've got stories in here that were nominated for the push cart that were rejected for 20 plus times. It's just, you know, finding, finding your, th the way you're going to write really unfortunately has nothing to do with acceptance and rejection. <laughs> it really yeah, it's doesn't. True. It's, it's, true. it's just like, you're just going to, you're just going to keep doing it. You know, you just got to mm -hmm. keep doing it. <laughs> true. I will say that if you, if you have the time, I mean, so much of it is time intensive, but if you have the time to um, read the award winners that are in the genre that you're interested in. So for me, that would be like reading the Shirley Jacksons. Mm. Uh, I always think those are like, those are eye-opening. Um, like, wow, these people are doing this stuff and they're like, you know, pushing this out or whatever. Um, I think reading those award type things. So if you're wanting to, you know, write flash fiction, maybe read best small fictions and, you know, go through and read the last issue and see kind of all that's the, the top of the top is out there, you know? Yeah. Kind of get a feel for what's on, like, I don't know, what do they say? Thumb on the pulse? Is that a phrase? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Cool. Well, that's super, super interesting. So where do you think people can stay connected with you then? Um, your next book is coming out. You've got a novel on the way at some point where can people stay connected with you um so the easiest way is probably through my website i like many of us um have <laughs> uh, our bailing ship on twitter so i feel like i thought i was um, like i wonder if twitter is going to come up today <laughs> yeah. I, I have i have that i haven't deactivated it's still on there uh, but i haven't yeah. checked it in quite a long time so um it is it is a bummer i met some really lovely writing people on there um yeah. that may, maybe maybe threads will be the be the writing answer to, <laughs> to do you that. think do you think you're um, gonna join threads yeah probably i i i like the i like the format i, I like connecting with people there there's um, a couple really excellent writers and agents and and so forth that i've met through that kind of interaction where i was like oh you you recommended this book and i fucking loved it i'm sorry if no. Anyway, I just realized that was the first time I've sworn this time. Um, but record. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no joke. <laughs> um, but I, I, I really valued those kind of connections that I made, and it's just sad that uh, the platform is doing what it's doing. So I, I may check it out. I may, I may check it out. Yeah. Um, but if you're if you're trying to stay connected, I do have my own website, which is just my whole name, uh, .com. And uh, I publish right now with 12 House Books, um, and they're they're pretty pretty rad. I don't know um, what other titles they have coming out this year. I should have probably checked on that, but I don't know for this for the sake of this. Um, okay. I'll link their website in our description or whatever, along with all our books and stuff that we talked about. Rad. And I don't get on Facebook because I don't like Facebook. See, I'm so, I feel like I'm such a, like a curmudgeon about social media. <laughs> <laughs> like, about it. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, it just means man. you're hip, right? Is that what it means? It feels yeah. the opposite, but that's all right. <laughs> um, Jumping yeah, on new yeah, social yeah, media, really leaving my... Facebook behind. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My 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 Facebook and maybe Threads here in a little bit, uh, or not Facebook. My website. My 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 personal emails on there. So like somebody reads the book and like really wants to chat about it you can just like literally just email me yeah cool awesome well thanks evan it's been an absolute treat and i hope people find children in their cages and give it a read thanks so much so yeah thank you for having me it's so nice yeah cheers <laughs>